So now I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters, Greg Long and Butler Newman. Greg Long is Vice President of Organizational Effectiveness at GP Strategies. He has more than 20 years of experience providing consulting services to numerous firms in the U.S. and overseas. He work, his work has focused on improving organizational, organizational and individual performance through conceptualizing, designing, and developing strategic solutions for various communities. These programs have resulted in increases in business results and individual performance measures. He graduated with a BS in Aerospace Engineering from the United States Naval Academy and has a Master's in Civil Engineering from Texas A&M University. Butler Newman is Vice President of Organizational Effectiveness at GP Strategies. He is a recognized leader in the field of organizational performance, consulting with business and learning leaders to ensure top performance and roles critical to their organization's success. He has consulted across diverse industries such as automotive, consumer products, retail, financial, telecommunications, healthcare, and pharmaceutical. He has led regional and global initiatives in the United States, the United Kingdom, Netherlands, South Africa, and Indonesia. He graduated with a B.S. in English from the United States Naval Academy and has received his Naval Nuclear Engineer certification while serving as a line officer in the Atlantic Fleet. We are uh, in very qualified hands, clearly, today, and I am excited that they are here to share their insights with us. So with that, Butler, I am going to turn presenter rights over to you. Thanks, Kayla, and welcome, everyone. We're glad you could join us for a few minutes today. Why is it that some people seem to always produce great results, while others work just as hard but can't seem to get those same great results? Today we want to answer those two questions and spend a few minutes discussing an approach to help good people produce great results. To begin, Greg, will you introduce us to three key players? Sure thing, Butler. So, First of all, let me introduce everybody to Mark. Mark is a top performer, and we're going to tell you his story of what that means to be a top performer. We'll also tell you about Francois. Francois is a good performer, and we're going to tell you a little bit more about what that is, but he's sort of in that category that Butler mentioned of a good person who just can't quite seem to get those great results out. And then, and then lastly, we're going to introduce you to Mary. Mary is a leader on a quest, and it's a quest that we're going to tell you uh, some more about as we go. So back to Mark. Mark is a top performer, as we said. Uh, and what that means is he's a customer service rep, a CSR, for a health insurance company. And it's a company that actually wants to provide outstanding service. They want to give you clear, correct, compassionate answers to your questions when you call. Uh, they actually do want to score high on all those things that they say about surveys. What they asked us and our challenge was to help them improve customer satisfaction when people call with questions about their health insurance. And as you can imagine, uh, and as we all know, health insurance is a highly competitive, very complex industry. So when people call the CSRs, call the helplines, they're, they're generally a little confused. They're often more than a little bit frustrated already, even before they call. Um, and as, as we know, we don't always have a great experience when we call the health insurance company. So the first thing that we did, our first challenge was to identify people who were already delivering the kind of results that they wanted, the top performers. And in this case, as in most cases, there were a handful of CSRs like Mark already doing great work. And great work in this particular case meant delivering high customer satisfaction scores. People were pleased with the service they got. They scored them high on their satisfaction surveys. High first call resolution. That means they got the complete answer. They understood it. They didn't have to have any callbacks. They didn't have to return uh, any calls. And frankly, the managers would love to have a call center filled with marks, just like most organizations would love to have their entire team staffed with, with top performers like Mark. But before we tell you too much about Mark, Let's stop and take a look at our approach. Butler, you want to fill us in? Sure, Greg. So, and actually, before I, I go into the, to any of the details on this slide, I think it's important to note that, that Greg and I have spent our early careers as operational leaders, living every day with the question, how do we get good people to produce excellent results? And in the, over the last 20 years, we have been working together 
quite frankly, experimenting with various approaches to solve this very real need. So two of the consistent observations over the last 20 years is that as we look at any role, any job, if you will, there's the typical normal distribution curve. And in that curve, you have some performers who, quite frankly, are struggling. The bulk, the large majority of performers are good people, but they're producing only average results. And then you have those top performers, those people who really just seem to consistently perform. So over, the, over these years, over the last seven years in particular, we have started to focus our attention on this last group, the top performers. It's very tempting when you think about top performers to fall into, well, these are just special people. They have the quote unquote it factor. But what we have found is that typically this is not the case. We have found some consistent threads about top performers. One, they do things differently in the role. Two, they spend their time differently in different ways than the average performers spend their time. And most importantly, they have a different mental model of what the actual job is, what the role is. So understanding that is critical. In fact, we have focused our attention on the top performers to the degree that they, what they do and understanding what they produce has become our design point. And we use that design point for a lot of different things. We use it for an array of integrated solutions to help move the middle so that their performance can start to look a lot more like the top performers. But let's go back to, to, to Mark, our, our top performer. So a little bit more about Mark. Um, you already know he's a top performer. Butler's told you about what that means. Uh, and all those things apply to Mark. He was humble. He didn't think he actually was a top performer. He didn't think he did anything different from anybody else. He was an unconscious expert. Uh, that's somebody that does what they do naturally they, just because they realize it's the right thing to do. Uh, but he had subconsciously divided the role of CSR into these three significant buckets. Uh, first of all, clarify the question. What is it that somebody's actually asking? Secondly, quickly find the right answer, and that means navigating through complex, complicated information systems, uh, lots and lots of screens in order to find the right data. And then third, clearly communicate that answer. Strip out all of the insurance jargon, the legalese, and all the other confusing bits in order to communicate that answer in a way that the caller can understand it. Um, and he did that. And so what we did is we watched Mark as he handled calls. We sat with him. We listened to the caller. We watched him on the screen. We took notes, trying to uncover what he did, those outcomes that Butler mentioned and how he handled the, the, the calls. And what we saw was that he had a, just a seemingly uncanny knack of predicting what each caller would ask. Before someone even asked for something, he had navigated to a different screen in the system, one where he found the right answer to the question that they were asking. And so we asked him to turn off the phone, stop for a second in between calls, and we asked him how did he know what this person was going to ask that he had just taken the call from. He said, I didn't know. I just, I just practiced active listening like they taught us. And clearly, that was just an approved answer. But we said, no, no, that's not, that's not what we saw. We saw you navigate first. How did you know? How did you guess what he was going to ask? And so he went back to the summary screen, and he showed us. Well, based on the information that's here, it's a reasonable guess that they'll ask this. And then we said, well, let's pull up another account. So he pulled up another account said, what would this person likely ask if they called? And we kept repeating that. And then we built this model about what is it that people would ask from a predictive point of view. And then we validated that model with other top performers across the organization. Turns out that, yep, we were able to build a fairly straightforward, simple job aid that helped people predict the call that they were the question that they were going to be asked by the caller, uh, and it was a dramatic impact. 
So once we had that, that algorithm built, we were able to train and coach and help other people to adopt that algorithm and use it in their work and improve the way that they handle calls. And think about it. If you know what somebody's going to ask, you can focus all of your energy and your efforts on clarifying, on finding the right answer and translating that answer and not having to pick through exactly what they're saying about um, what, they, uh, what they really want to know. So let's pull back from Mark now that you understand what it meant for him to be a top performer and talk a little bit more about the approach from a generic perspective. So, Vol, are you going to walk us through that? Sure. Thanks, Greg. So, Greg and I both now have mentioned outcomes. So, you know, let's look at this. This, And it's very interesting. Um, we often find that top performers have these little tidbits that no one possibly could have guessed, like this predictive method of navigating to the right screen that Mark was doing. Um, but it was very trans a very transferable skill, if you will, and easily taught to others. But so that was a specific thing that was adding value to the role and ultimately adding value to the business. We call those outcomes. So, for example, the wording for the outcome that Greg just described for Mark, we would say it this way, that Mark produced an accurate prediction of specific customer requests. And that was just one of about six or seven outcomes that he that that in this case Mark was able to produce. So these outcomes are things that are produced by top performers that add value to the role and value to the organization. It requires what we call a quarter turn in thinking because we're no longer asking the question, "What do people need to know?" We're no longer asking the question, what do people need to do? We are first asking the question, what do people need to produce in order to be a top performer? So this outcomes thinking, this quarter turn is critical. And, and we have summarized this in four steps. Number one and two we've already talked about, identify top performers and uncover these critical outcomes. With that as the design point, we can then develop programs to equip people and follow up with coaching. And in fact, let's go back to Francois now, who is with a different company, a different role, but he has undergone the programs to move him, if you will. And so Greg, pick it up from there. Thanks. So Francois, as Butler said, he was not a top performer, frankly. He was a team leader from a different organization, in this case, a financial services uh, institution. Good, solid performer, working hard, uh, trying to help his team produce great results. Uh, and specifically, it's a sales team, obviously, it's a sales kind of a role. And he was skeptical about this whole outcomes thinking approach. Uh, he thought he was doing the right thing, he thought he was working hard, uh, he was clearly motivated. So as he went to a role excellence workshop, he didn't come in with a completely open mind, but he was, he was willing to listen. And there he learned about this outcomes approach, and in particular, the profile of excellence, the, the list of outcomes, the, the specifications or design points, as Butler said, of how the, the best, the top leaders from other teams, and he realized immediately that those were a different list than what he was focusing on, that they, that different mental model really showed up. So to his credit, he was willing to set aside his skepticism, shift his focus, and concentrate on producing these new outcomes and, and have, frankly, a new approach to helping his team. The results were great. Uh, he is now producing great results and his team in turn is producing great results. But he tells it better than we could. As he says there, I could have stuck with the old model, but I didn't. I used your outcomes-based approach instead. And he goes on and he talks about the impact. In fact, in just under a month, just one of his team members produced over a million dollars of direct business impact. So he's no longer a skeptic. Uh, he's now a believer, and he is in turn helping good people produce great results. So Mark, our top performer, Francois, our good performer, now producing great results. But what about Mary? What's this bit about Mary and her quest? Well, Greg, you know, one of the things that we have discovered is that every organization needs a Mary. Someone who is on a quest 
to improve performance of the organization by improving the performance of the individuals that make up that organization. Now, Mary was a young leader at a large major pharmaceutical company, and she was truly on a quest for a better way to impact the performance of the field sales force. She had discovered outcomes thinking, but it went against the culture, the established traditional approach to training. Nonetheless, she picked a critical role. She fought for it with insight, with courage, and vanguard leadership, and we'll talk about that in a second, to make it happen, all to produce good, strong, positive results that transformed the approach to training for the, for the organization that added areas that were not even on the radar previously to what they equipped people to do, that focused the existing coaching efforts, all leading to significant positive impact for the business. So if we think about Mary, what was unique about her? One, she had a recognition that the old model was no longer going to work and that she had to change. And, and if we're all honest, that's tough making that recommend, uh, uh, realization and, and, and thinking about what it means to change the way we've, we've typically done things. Two, she was actively searching for a new approach to improve performance. And three, she was willing to take some personal risk in her job to be a vanguard leader. And by vanguard leader, we mean that she was willing to be out front, that she was in front of the organization showing the way. And then lastly, but maybe most importantly, she had perseverance to see it through. She fought through the challenges that arose. She fought through the naysayers. She fought through the change in direction for training. She fought all the way to improve performance in the business. So every organization needs a Mary. Mary is a true game changer. Greg, take it up from there. So this, this notion of game changers is interesting. They see the world a little differently. And with, with all apologies to Robert Kennedy, some people see things as they are and accept them. Game changers dream of a better way and relentlessly pursue the quest to change that status quo. So uh, that's our story. Uh, we're sticking to it. Uh, Kayla, have we got any questions that come in in the minute or so that we've got left? Sounds good. Well, thanks, guys, for that great presentation. Uh, we do only have a minute or so left. So as a reminder, if you have a question, enter it into the Q&A module at this time. Um, Butler and Greg covered a lot in only 20 minutes, and there's obviously a lot more that we can discuss. And so we encourage you to continue the conversation with them. Um, as you can see um, on this last slide, that their con uh, contact info is available. Uh, and we will send everybody a link to a follow-up blog post where they will address some of today's key takeaways. I would also like to remind you that the recording and the slides from today will also be sent to the email address that you provided, and we'll make sure to get this to everybody um, within the next 48 hours. It does oh. look like, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Kayla. Uh, did you mention the blog? Um, we'll send, yeah, we'll, we'll send a blog post out, yep. Okay, great. And and I was Greg and Kayla, I was thinking, what if why don't we for the first five people who sign up for the blog send them a copy of the book? I think that's a great idea. Could we do that, Kayla? Yeah, absolutely. So um uh the, I believe that information is on this slide right here. So um yeah, as I just mentioned, if you if you go ahead and register and sign up for that, that blog, then um yeah, we can certainly have those books sent out. So those that the first five people you said? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Oh, that's very generous. Um, so we do actually, it looks like we do have a couple of questions coming in, so we'll go ahead and get to those. Um, this first one is, have you used this approach to develop training courses? Yes, a a absolutely. And uh, for courses uh, specifically, but maybe more importantly, for a full curricula. I mean, what's the, what is the path that someone should go through to equip them to be able to simulate, if you will, or not simulate, but actually produce results and outcomes in a manner uh, very close to what the top performers are able to do. And, and you know, 
sometimes organizations really focus on their top performers and how can they make them better. But uh, we find that the real potential in most organizations is how can you move that middle. And so by developing a, a full curriculum, if you will, uh, based on the design point of the top performers, you can make tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, movement and shift the curve, if you will. Great. Um, we, we're about a minute over, so I'm going I'm to do one more. And then um, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to still enter them into the Q&A. Uh, we will address them in that follow-up blog post that we discussed a little bit ago. So um, I throw this last one out here for you. Uh, does this work for all types of jobs? That's a great question. We've actually done this kind of work with jobs ranging from, obviously, the, the stories that you've seen, and these are all based on real people that we talked about today in sales and marketing and leadership. Uh, in call centers of, of multiple types, but also in, in technical operations and, and maintenance organizations and roles, uh, from roles in distribution centers, uh, all the way to C-level roles, um, and all the way to the front line. It works best, frankly, where there are critical roles that impact the business results of an organization. That's where you can really have the best impact when you shift that performance curve like Butler described. Great. Well, I apologize if we didn't get to anyone's question. Um, we'll, we'll address that in that blog post, but I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, so thank you again to today's speakers, Greg Long and Butler Newman, and thanks to everyone who attended for your time and attention. We hope that you'll join us again for our next GP Strategies webinar. Uh, it will be held on August 12th with Sherry Weppel, and the topic is ROI, what investment are you really measuring? So thanks again, everyone, and for GP Strategies, I'm Kayla Roth, and I wish everyone a great day.